Hi, and welcome to the Parker J. Cole Show. I am your host, the Queen, Parker J. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we're going to be talking to my guest co-host and contributor today, Jeff Rhodes. He is the author of the book, The Bible Dimensions and Spiritual Realm. And you may re remember that from the last time he was on the Parker J. Cole Show. We really had a great time talking about the Bible, the spiritual realm and dimensions, and really giving you just a taste of how deep reality is and what it means for us as Christians and believers. Now we're back again talking about something that's going to be very interesting. We're going to be talking about transhumanism and the metaverse. But I got to tell you, we are not the origins of this particular conversation. This conversation comes from an article called Transhumanism and the Metaverse, and it's by a gentleman named Charles Eisenstein. We found it on his Substack, and I want to thank Jeremy Bullard for the connection, because when he read this article, he knew that I would be interested in something like this, so he contacted me. So I want to thank Jeremy Bullard for the connection. And then as soon as I read it, I said, oh my gosh, Dr. Rhodes would love to read something like this. So I contacted him and said, hey, you want to check this out so we can do a show on it. And he was so on board. So I can't wait to delve into this topic in just a few moments. We have been showcasing Christian authors for the past nine years. And as God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. To find out how you can help out, simply go to patreon.com slash write stuff and see what you can do. And as always, you covet your prayers. To stay up to date with PJC Media, go ahead and go to pjcmedia.net, click that pink button, and you'll never, ever have to miss a show. As we get started in our discussion, I definitely want to share a comment that we received from Jeremy, who is the one who connected us with this topic. So Jeremy says this, one of the oldest questions known to man, and perhaps the most difficult yet most important to answer is, who am I? Why am I here? Greek playwright. Aeschylus and scholars Socrates and Plato gravely advise to know thyself. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, Polonius advises Laertes, this above all, to thine own self be true. This question is at the very heart of what it means to be human. Transhumanism compounds that question. The transhumanists must not only ask, who am I, but now they have to follow up with what will or what have I become. Hollywood can give a real good treatment on the dangers of not asking those questions. And for me, that's the problem. Many transhumanists don't ask those questions. All they are concerned with is the fact that whoever they are now, they're not enough. And so they blindly seek to become more through appliances or cybernetics or what have you, because they can become more. And there are so many issues with that, because the same issues that we have as natural human beings for example, why diet and exercise discipline where you can buy a slimmer waist follow us into transhumanism? For example, why work out where you can buy muscles or why learn where you can download knowledge? Transhumanism exasperates a problem as old as who am I? It tempts us to usurp God. It argues that however God made us is not good enough and it's on us to improve upon his shoddy work. This thought really catches wind when considering the metaverse where the user is actually encouraged to be God, to feed their desires without repercussion, and to exercise their assumed authority with impunity. That's not to say that the metaverse or cybernetic enhancement are inherently bad, of course, but the more we worship ourselves, the less beholden we are to the God who legitimately has authority over us. And that's a comment from Jeremy Bullard from Dothan, Alabama. Jeremy, as always, thank you for your support of the show and for joining in the conversation. And so I'm going to bring Dr. Rhodes, rather Jeff, onto the air right now. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing great, Parker J. Thanks for having me on. And thank you for being with me, too. You know, this topic of transhumanism and the metaverse is right up both our alleys. And as I describe this article, I describe it as brain gum. And Mr. Eisenstein is so effective in his words that the more you read this article, you find more things to capture your interest and to make you to think. And I think that was the point of this article is just to make people think and consider what they consider reality and what they consider the metaverse and how they are separate and how they are not interconnected. That's what I think. But there's a lot going on in this article. There isn't any way possible we can go through the whole article. It would probably take 10 hours to go through this short article. It's only 8,000 words, but let me tell you, 
there's so much packed into those 8,000 words. So Mr. Eisenstein is very good at bringing his thoughts together. But before we get into the article, I want you to go ahead and introduce yourself to our listeners today. Thank you, Parker J. My name is Jeff Rhodes. I wrote a book called The Bible, Dimensions, and the Spiritual Realm, where I talk about, is heaven real? Is it a real place? And where is it located? So I use some science as science points to higher dimensions and the possibility that heaven is a higher dimension, and then it's really very close to where we're at. So I'd love for you to check out my book. You can get it on Amazon. And that is what helped me kind of think in these abstract ways and the uh, simulated universe, uh, metaverse. And I was very interested in this article and very excited to read it when you sent that to me. Yeah, and this article really does give you the thought process of considering reality. And is reality important? And is virtual reality as important as reality? There are a lot of things going on here, but it also talks about the human condition because transhumanism, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, postulates that it's possible to program people to be a certain way. But is it possible to program people? That's the question that this article delves into in subtle ways. And even if it doesn't go deep into that discussion, it does make you think and want to do your own research and your own reading. So we can't wait to get into this. But before I do that, real quick, Jeff, from the last time we were on the show, have you been promoting the Bible dimensions and the spiritual realm? I've had the opportunity to be on several radio shows and podcasts to talk about this uh, unique book. It's, it's kind of unique. There's not a lot of other books kind of like that, that, that kind of tackle that subject of where heaven is. A lot of people talk about experiences in heaven, or they died and experienced heaven and came back to life. But from the aspect of where is it? Does it have spatial dimensions? Uh, there's, I've been on several shows to talk about that. People have found that to be interesting and, and an interesting angle. And it definitely is. So that's why I really enjoyed your book when you had it on there. I'm so glad we got connected because now we're going to talk about this. So what I want to do for our listeners, I'm going to read certain sections of Mr. Eisenstein's article called Transhumanism and the Metaverse. And then in the show links, I'm going to give you an opportunity to go to the article itself so you can read it for yourself. It's very, very informative, and I know it will make you think. So I'm going to read the introduction of Transhumanism and the Metaverse by Mr. Charles Eisenstein. It's broken up into several sections, so I'm going to read the first section of this particular article and the introduction. Then me and Dr. Rhodes are going to discuss it. The first section of this is called The Gospel of Progress. Mr. Eisenstein says, ever since the archaic divergence of humanity from other hominids, our systems of tools and symbols have developed at an accelerating pace. We depend less and less on the physical capacities of our bodies. We operate more and more in the realm of information, data, words, numbers, and bits. Quite naturally, then, we have conceived an idea of progress that celebrates this development and a destiny narrative that foresees its endless continuation. Its future is one where we integrate technology ever more fully into our bodies until we become something more than just bodies. It is one where we immerse ourselves so fully into representation that virtual reality becomes more compelling to us than material reality. The first is called transhumanism, and the second is the metaverse. Now, hearing that, Dr. Rhodes, what are some of the thoughts coming to mind right now? So some of the thoughts that, that I have is when the virtual reality becomes more compelling than the material reality. And that is kind of where we are moving with technology. And that's what that's that really the, the sub statement of this whole article. Now, the metaverse for those, it's kind of a new thing. It, it, there's a lot of people talk about it. Just so people know, the metaverse is this digital virtual reality that people can access really through, through your computer. You put the goggles on, you can go to a store, you, you don't have to leave your house. You are in your brain going to a store to pick out something, to buy something. And Parker J., I just, when I was reading this article, about the same time, you had a few big churches that came out with their metaverse campus where you could go to church through the metaverse. So James River Assembly down in uh, Springfield, Missouri, is one of those. That it's a very large church, and you you can. Um, I'm not sure exactly if you purchase the, the 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 software or how they have it, but you can go into church and you're in their church. You watch their service, 
You can be in a small group with somebody. You can say hi to people. And you're doing it all from your chair inside your living room with these goggles on. So there, that that is coming. And people are trying to, churches, in, for example, are trying to see how they can access that and connect people together with that. Is it good? Is it bad? That's what this article talks about. Another aspect of a conversation that Mr. Eisenstein says is this. That goal has always been implicit in the ideology known as progress. It equates the advancement of the human species with improvements in our ability to control nature and make its functions our own. When we replace the shovel with the bulldozer, that's progress. It aspires to a godlike estate of lordship over nature. Descartes, arguably the most important preceptor of modernity, put it famously in his Declaration of Human Destiny to become through science and technology the lords and possessors of nature. And so he goes on throughout this whole article, really giving us an idea of how this virtual reality or the metaverse and how transhumanism work together to really immerse us in a reality that is not material. But he begins to ask us questions or give us food for thought about, is this really where we want to be? And I like that this particular article it is as probably as objective as you can possibly get with a person because we all have a bias. So this is probably the most objective article I've read on this topic. So I'm really glad to delve into it. However, Dr. Rhodes and I are going to be coming from a biblical perspective. We're going to be coming through that because we view the world through biblical lens. We are children of God. We are saved by grace through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice. And we believe in him. So we're going to be viewing a lot of things in this article through that lens. So let's go ahead and start with one of the third part of this article is called Chasing a Mirage. And so I'm going to read a section here. Transhumanism holds a different ideal. As we bring tighter and more precise control to the human realm, we separate off from the natural. Transhumanism is an expression of the much older idea of transcendentalism which holds human destiny to lie in the transcendence of the material realm. The metaverse is a modern version of heaven, a spiritual domain. It is a realm of pure mind, a pure symbol, a complete freedom from natural limits. In the metaverse, no fundamental limit pertains to how much virtual land you can own, how many virtual outfits your avatar can wear, or how much virtual money you can have. Whatever limits exist are artificial, imposed by the software engineers to make the game interesting and profitable. Today, there is quite a market for virtual real estate in the metaverse, but its scarcity and therefore its value is completely artificial. And then he goes on to say in this article, he says here, he goes on to say here, thanks to excavators, we no longer need to suffer aching muscles to dig a house foundation. Thanks to all kinds of pharmaceutical drugs, we no longer need to feel the pain of various medical conditions. Yet somehow we have not banished pain, fatigue, suffering, or stress, even in the most affluent parts of society. And it makes you go to the Bible and Mark chapter 14, verse 7 says this, For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good, but me ye have not always. So let's talk about this. I hope I it was a little bit jumbled there because I'm just trying to get certain sections of this article, Dr. Rhodes. But what are some of your thoughts as you read that article and bring it into a biblical lens? So my, my initial thought on this is, is he does a really good job of talking about how we've used technology to better our living situations and life. And he, and he really goes back. He doesn't just really talk about computers and data. I mean, he even goes back farther than that, that we've always... We've used technology to help us. And with the good comes the bad. And in this, he's talking about trying that we will try to get rid of of all the conditions really that sin has caused, right? That there would be maybe no more death, no more sickness, no more work, no more injustice. Well, those four things are result of us living in a sinful, broken world. So it's natural for us to always try to overcome those. We're always trying to overcome the the curse of sin, whether it's air conditioning to overcome the weather that's been affected by sin or whether it's uh, working to to have money to overcome uh, sin because we we have to work or death or sickness. And 
he's saying that we will try to use this metaverse. We're going to try to use this technology to help us overcome something. Now, like, I don't know this man's uh, uh, spiritual condition to be saved or not, but we know as Christians that we live in a broken world and we can never create heaven on earth. And I think this further keeps us chasing something instead of looking for the problem. The problem is sin. The answer is Jesus Christ. And when he says we have the poor with us always, sometimes we're thinking of poor people. We need to help the poor. And, and we do. But, but the, this is the case. We will have sin with us always. And the answer is Jesus Christ, not more technology or not the metaverse. That's really what I think about. I have to go into a show that I saw on Netflix uh, about a year ago called Alien World. Very good show. It was talking about the evolution of alien life on different planets and how it would look like. And in one of those scenarios, they had a simulation of a planet and the inhabitants of that planet no longer needed their physical bodies. So they show the inhabitants in cubes, black goo. And they were fed by robots, but they were able to move away from a planet being enveloped by its star to a more distant planet in their solar system. And the robots did all the work. They were able to harness the solar energy of their star to make this happen. And as I was looking at that particular scenario that they postulated, I said, that is an awful, 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 (laughs) awful future, Dr. Rose. If we're going to evolve into black goo, we don't have barbecues anymore. We don't uh, make love. We don't die. We just live in a box serviced by robots. And that was the ultimate of evolution. I thought that was a horrible place to be. And then we're fed proteins through robots. But we can move our civilization from a planet that's dying from its star to a more distant planet. And we didn't have to do a thing. And I thought that was extremely sad. And what he does here is kind of highlight that because here we are, if this is the evolutionary utopia, we're in boxes being fed by robots. There you go. (laughs) You know what I mean, Dr. Rhodes? And so when he mentioned this, I couldn't help but think about that episode of Alien Worlds. He goes on here to say, you will notice physical pain, emotional pain, anxiety, fatigue, and stress. Each person you see is a divinity incarnate doing its best under conditions that serve, that little serve its flourishing. Yet even so, the beauty is still there. The divinity seeking relentlessly to express itself, life seeking to live. And you would want to read the whole article to get the context of this. But what he's saying is these things still exist in our society, even though we have, quote unquote, progress into being more reliant on information than our physical bodies. So the next part of his article talks about virtual children of a virtual world. And before I go into that, I want to read Psalms 127. And 127 says, verse three says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now here, the Lord says children are a heritage of the Lord and a fruit of the womb. So children are a good thing. They're a gift from God. How many people, when they have found out they're going to have a child, have had their whole lives change, often for the better, because they no longer focus on themselves. They focus on the child and making the world a better place for their child. So he goes on to say here, he talks about virtual children. Take, for example, the wonderful new innovation of virtual children. Yes, you read that right. Also known as Tomagachi children, they are autonomous AI software bots programmed to flourish if they receive enough digital care and attention and presumably purchase accessories. Mainstream media touts them as a solution to loneliness, overpopulation, and climate change. Don't you find that interesting, Dr. Rose? They will say virtual children are a solution to loneliness, overpopulation, and climate change. What are your thoughts on that? As far as them being a solution for loneliness, that that's not going to be the case because there's no interaction there that hasn't been pre-programmed. When I see the AI humans, then what I really think of it, it's us playing God because we have to program these humanoids or these, you know, intelligent uh, robots. So what rules do we give them? What guides them? What is the, you know, when we as, as beings, we have these free will, we're, we're born, we have choices to make. 
and we have the Bible to guide us, and we have guidelines. So what what are the guidelines that we make this? And in a fallen world, you can really see the darkness of how some of these would be programmed and the uses that some of them uh, would have. It's not going to cure loneliness, and it's just only going to, you know, I don't want to get too dark. Uh, you know, there's computer is used for a lot of bad things and pornography and such. And this opens up a whole world of not curing loneliness, but causing a bigger problem in that. Having a robot kid does, is not the answer because we, we're not seeing God's creation. We're seeing man's fallen creation. You make a really good point here, and it brings you to another topic I want us to discuss that this article really helps you to delve into. And it's about reality versus delusion. And I want to preface this with how the article talks about how we become less human as we integrate with our technology, because transhumanism basically says that humans can be dialed up to a particular point to stop us from acting bad, to get basically to get rid of sin. Can you be dialed up to get rid of sin? Oh, the only way to get rid of sin is to make sure that we can't interact with reality anymore. Instead, we'll make a reality that we like and we'll be in that reality. And so here he talks here, I use the term postmodern here deliberately. As an intellectual movement, postmodernism dovetails with immersion in a world of symbols detached from matter. The metaverse reifies the postmodern doctrine that everything is a text, that reality is a social construct, that one is whatever one asserts oneself to be because isness is a mere discourse. So it is in the world of online avatars. Appearance and reality are one and the same. Reality is infinitely malleable, arbitrary, a construct. So it seems to anyone immersed in the realm of representation. The symbol, beginning it once symbolized anything, becomes real in its own right. Commercial brands assume a value detached from the material substrate that gave them value in the first place. Call it Gucci and the handbag becomes valuable regardless of its quality. Eventually, the product may disappear entirely into virtual reality, leaving only the brand. And I thought this was really insightful, Ms. Eisenstein's article here, because he talks about we're following the symbol, forgetting that the symbol at one point was born in reality. But he says there's this growing thing to just get rid of the reality and just immerse ourselves in the delusion. So go ahead, let's talk about that real quick. Yeah, one of the most amazing things of really having the computer age and really the uh, you know World Wide Web, which is not that old, really, is this, you're able to become something to some other people that don't know you and create this image that is only seen to other people. Let me give you an example. Facebook. Facebook started out as really as a really positive thing, I believe, in that you reconnected with old friends. You say, hey, what's going on in your life? And you're posting real pictures of your real life. And it slowly has morphed into me putting my highlights out there and then almost making fake pictures of fake things and a fake life to make you think or others think that I'm living a life that I wish I lived. So, and now that's where we're at or where we have been to this Instagram sensation people that only thing I know about this person is the 200 pictures and small video clips I, I see. So that's, that's who I believe that person is. And that's who that person wants me to believe when really they're maybe dying inside, they're depressed inside, they're having some kind of battles going on because they know that they're living two different lives. So now we're taking it to another extreme. I think he does an excellent job in this article of pointing to that is that now we're going to go into this, uh, this metaverse to where we believe we're that person. Not only, and so you have this kind of uh, division and this duplicity, uh, this deceiving of oneself that really I'm a sinner fallen who needs Jesus Christ to repair this brokenness of who I am. But everybody out there thinks I'm perfect. And I, and I put this perfect person out there and I can become somebody who I am really not to people. I think he points to it. That's where it's going. And I, and I believe we're already there with Facebook and a few other things. And this is going to push us even farther down that road. And it also goes back to the idea that you have to be, quote unquote, so careful what you put on social media, 
because your social media account can make or break you having a job being approved by society. You can get canceled if you say something that goes against a popular narrative. And so these are the things that are happening now that we can see. And people are trying to fight back because we all understand that people are nuanced. And just what we say on social media or in the virtual realm doesn't make us us. But that gets into another subject we won't go into today. But I just wanted to throw that out there. And there's another thing that's really the, I would say, the core of our discussion here and what this article really represents. It's all about what happened in the garden at the creation of all. And it goes talking about. In Genesis chapter three, after the fall, they both realized that they were naked. So Adam and Eve both realized they were naked. So I'm just going to read from verse seven. And it says, and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. And I want to go into this real quickly because this sentence really packs a wallop as to what's going on. And it really underpins this whole article. Go ahead and expand on that for us. So, so here you have in the Garden of Eden, when man was perfect and then they sinned, the first thing they did is they realized their shame. So they tried to cover their shame with their own man-made effort. So the fig leaf is representative of that which man does to cover their sin or to cover their shame and to make it go away. We see that in trying to do good works to make our sin go away. We see that in trying to go to church to make our sin go away trying to do things to make sin go away, trying to drink or do drugs or something to forget about our sin. It's all seen in man's way. But then God comes along later and it says he made tunics of skin for them. So we see that ultimately what had to happen was God had to cover man's sin, that God had to cover their sin with a tunic of skin. So a sacrifice was made, an animal was killed. Doesn't tell us what animal died to cover their sin. I would presume it was a lamb if we're going to be consistent through scripture. And so we have in that, that man's sin is covered by God, which is grace. So only God can cover our sin. So one of the most important parts about becoming a Christian, about seeing Christianity or seeing God is understanding who we are in reality. And the metaverse appears to take us farther away from that. It helps us. It's a giant fig leaf that covers our sin and we can become somebody who we're not. So we're not dealing with reality. We're not dealing with who we are. And at some point in time, our brokenness, our lostness, who we are really will come popping out. And that's where many times you, you people come depressed or they're, they become lost, not knowing how to, to cure their sin. We know that Jesus Christ is the answer. And Jesus Christ really just says, we are sinners and we're born sinners, but he has given us a gift. He paid the price on the cross. He paid for our sins. He lived the perfect life. And he gives us the opportunity to accept his righteousness and clothe ourselves and be righteous in Christ. So that's what we need to cover ourselves with, Christ, instead of the metaverse or instead of Facebook or instead of Instagram or instead of running away from that. And I think that's where this author has done a great job saying we're going to go so far deep in this metaverse that we're going to be covering ourselves with something that we have been deceived with. And now we have deceived ourselves. The Bible says, be not deceived. So we deceive ourselves. We've told ourselves a lie. And that's Satan's biggest tool is to deceive us is to make us think that we're okay or we're all right. One thing for sure, as someone told me recently, reality has a way of catching up with you. That no matter how deluded you become, something is going to happen where you're going to have to face reality. And the Lord doesn't tell us to stay away from reality. He says, in this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's something you can hang your hat on. That no matter what happens, no matter what's going on in your life, You can overcome those obstacles if you have the Lord Jesus Christ within you. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. I know, Dr. Rose, you probably know more about that. It's not going to be easy walking in this life with Christ. No one ever said that. And see, what the metaverse and transhumanism wants to do is take away the struggle, take away the agony, take away this. But one thing that this article pointed out, he said, isn't it interesting? How does it feel like you have these virtual children, but then you have 200 million children? who don't have anything to eat. What about them? The metaverse inoculates you from reality and the Lord calls us to be change agents in reality. That's why you have various organizations trying to help other organizations 
to make an impact in places where the poverty is real low. We're not having all these programs to help people who don't have money to have money. We can't work with them in the virtual world. They need help in the real world, <laughs> right, Jeff? What are your thoughts on that? I agree with you 100% on that. One of the, I was a missionary in Central America for 10 years. And one of the greatest things that we could do was bring people on a mission trip so they could see how other people lived. There was poor people and how they, how they lived. There was a couple of things that, that Americans always did. The first thing they, would, they saw poor people or, and they wanted to fix their problems with money. That's the first thing. They wanted to just give them money. And then they realized after being there a little while that uh, what they really needed was Jesus Christ. And then uh, what they would re realize after that is these poor people that we hung around with, they had a joy that many of the Americans didn't have. And why did, how can a poor person have joy? And it was good for them to realize that money does not equal happiness. Now, we need, to, we need to help people eat. We need to provide food for people. They need the basics. But sometimes those that have the basics and they're just poor are sometimes happier than the people who are rich. The key is, is our faith in, in Jesus Christ. But going back to your point is getting people there. If, if, if they never went there, they never got that burden. And for us to stay in uh, inside our cocoon, on our computer, with our VR goggles on, we're never really going to see the reality of God's world unless we touch, smell, feel, hug, love. I mean, how can you really understand love if you're not near or with another person? You're going to only, can you do that through the VR world? That would be the big question. And I think that's a really good place to end our show today. I really want to encourage our listeners to go to Mr. Eisenstein's Substack and read this article. And the link will be available in the show notes of this episode, because I really, really think at the least he'll make you think just like he made Jeff and I think. And we just really want to talk about this. We did not even scratch the surface of this article because it's so in-depth and so concise. And yet it's full full, full of so many things for us to consider. And I really, really want to thank Mr. Eisenstein for producing this article, giving us an opportunity to talk about it. And um, hopefully we may actually come back and do some more on this article and talk about it. Me and Jeff will talk about that offline. But what I really enjoyed about um, you being here with me today, Jeff, is just helping us to unpack these topics that Christians need to be engaged in society. The Lord calls us to engage. And right now, there's this weird movement of trying to make us xenophobes. And I said, the Lord didn't say be xenophobes. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go out and be fishers of men. You're not fishers of men if you're sitting, standing still. You're, you're doing something, you're moving. And right now we can reach so many people with technology. And I don't think Mr. Einstein is against technology. I think he's against this pervasiveness of human interaction and human reality. I think that's what it is. But Jeff, in the few moments we have left, and thank you for again for being with me on the show, where can people connect with you online? You can go to my website at wellingbooks.com, wellingbooks.com. You can see my book at amazon.com. Just to Google the Bible dimensions in the spiritual realm. You can find me on Facebook at Jeff Rhodes, or you can go to our church's website. I'm the administrative pastor at Topeka Baptist Church, topekabaptist.org and uh, see the sermons and see some teachings there. I do appreciate you having me on, Parker. It's always great to talk about things from the Lord's point of view and, and get that perspective on things because I think the world needs that. Hey, Amen. And I think, too, topics like this really let, need to let Christians know we can all have talks about Christian living, Christian devotion, but God is so vast and he's so multifaceted. We can never really probe the depths of him. We would have to have an eternity to do that. And articles like this lets us know that there are people asking very deep questions and the Lord has the answers to those very deep questions. And this is one of them. And I think we need to be available to have answers to that, especially when we're going to look at it through a biblical lens. So again, Jeff, thank you for being with me today. And to our listeners, thank you for joining me on this edition of the Parker J. Cole Show. Again, please, I encourage you rather to read Mr. Eisenstein's article, Transhumanism and the Metaverse. And the link to that article will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of the Parker J. Cole Show. You have a wonderful, absolutely glorious, blessed day. And God bless. <music>